weights and cardio. But what you'll see is really my goal for tonight is to give you a better framework of how to think about fitness in general, because it just seems to me that when we talk to people, uh, they have this general opinion that basically we're, you know, there's, there's weights and there's cardio. And I really, my goal for tonight is to give you a better understanding, a more, you know, global view, more holistic view, I guess, of thinking about, about fitness. Um, so anyway, let's get started. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, so you should see my screen. And <clears throat> fortunately, I couldn't close this part of the, uh, this part. Um, we have some more people coming in. Hello, everyone. And we're gonna really break down how would, we're gonna start by thinking about it from the perspective of someone who is studying phys human physiology. How would someone who's studying human physiology measure fitness? How do they measure fitness? And that gives us a better understanding of looking at it from a more scientific perspective. And what you're going to see as we go through this is there's a whole, there's so many other ways of thinking about fitness. It's not, you know, how one measure you could say, well, I can run a mile in, in this amount or I can lift this amount. But how do we look at it from different avenues, different angles? And that's really what I want to talk about with, uh, with this first section. So really when it comes to measuring fitness, this is sort of how physiologists think about it, people who study human physiology. And a lot of people, a lot of them look at VO2 max. And this is basically a measure of how your blood takes up oxygen. Because if you think about how we are when it comes to fitness or when it comes to being healthy, if our body is not able to take up oxygen and release oxygen, in the right way or in a, a fast ma manner, then we're not able to function the way we normally do. I remember when I was first reading about VO2 max, of course, in, in medical school, in, in, uh, in physiology, we, we you know, learned what VO2 max was, but I never really learned much, you know, never really got into it deeply until I read an article about Lance Armstrong. And Lance Armstrong, they were checking his, they were testing his VO2, um, with, with the mask to, to see how oxygen was being delivered and, and taken. And he had this VO2 max that was just like insanely high. Of course, later on, we realized that, that he was doping and had more red blood cells uh, in his body than, um, than he should. Uh, what impacts it is that it's a question of how many RBCs you have, how many red blood cells. Uh, we went through red blood cells a couple of weeks ago how adapted to endurance are you? So that's going to relate to, are your muscles efficient at, you know, absorbing this and, uh, and the tissues in your body in general of absorbing uh, and using the, the oxygen and how much blood can you pump? Uh, which obviously is a measure of overall cardi cardiovascular fitness. How, how, how effective is your heart at delivering blood so that it, you can take it up? Now, obviously, um, we'll get into, you know, what makes it, what sort of a definition of an endurance exercise is, but there's no question that high intensity interval training, uh, which we'll define in just a moment, uh, as well as Tabata, Tabata, which was named after a Japanese doctor who came up with a very short exercise. And uh, essentially what it is, of course, is we can look at high intensity exercise it, and the way it should be defined is it's obviously it's going to be different for everyone. So what I mean by that is you can generally think of it as an exercise that is making it so that you, you are out of breath or, you know, it would be difficult for you to carry on a conversation as, as some experts sometimes describe it. And what they learned is that in order to get fitness, especially to increase VO2 max, and to just increase overall, overall fitness, which of course we're lear learning about now, you really only need short bursts of activity. And this is really counterintuitive if you really think about it. Let's, let's look at what Dr. Tabata did. So they, can, they conducted research on two groups. The first group trained at moderate intensity, while the second group uh, trained at high intensity level. 
The moderate intensity group worked out five days a week for a total of six weeks. Each workout lasted an hour. So first group basically did a one hour workout, not, not so hard. The high intensity uh, group worked out four days a week for six weeks, but each workout lasted only four minutes and 20 seconds with 10 seconds of rest between, in between each set. Now this was an incredibly high intensity four minutes, but still, I mean, it just is an amazing thing to think now that we have here, we have a group working out an hour and then we have another group working out four minutes. And what was the results show? The results show that group one obviously had some, some increased uh, effects in cardiovascular, but showed little or no results for their anaerobic system. So the muscle. Um, group two showed much more increase in their aerobic than group one and increased their aerobic by 28%. So in, in other words, they were able to affect both the, the aerobic and the anaerobic, meaning, you know, without oxygen, so uh, anaerobic, with four minutes. Now that should really sink in because that's amazing. I mean, the fact, the fact that anyone would even think that they would outperform is, I would, I would never think that. Um, so kudos to Dr. Tabata. And this is, this, these studies have been repeated many, many times. I think, you know, I, it would be interesting to know for me, if he, if he was looking, if he expected actually an, an improved um, outcome versus, versus just, you know, maybe he thought, well, it would show an effect, but maybe not as much of an effect. So what are the lessons that we can learn from this particular study? What we can learn, of course, is that there is something special when you go high intensity. Now, not everyone, and I'm not recommending that everyone jump in, into doing high intensity interval training. You should talk to anything I say today, of course, you should talk to your doctor about, but uh, realize that high intensity interval training is going to be different for everyone and is related, in fact, to the fact that you are at a point where you're sort of of, of huffing and puffing uh, pretty, pretty intensely. And that would be, of course, different depending <coughs> on your overall <clears throat> fitness. So I'm pretty certain that the original studies were actually done on people uh, using a, a, a bike, like a stationary bike, and they were literally dropping after these four minutes. I mean, it was absolute maximal intensity. And quite frankly, not everyone is capable of doing that. So that's one way of measuring, um, that's one way of measuring fitness, looking at this VO2 max and how, how good your oxygen, how good your body is at um, absorbing and delivering oxygen. The next would be, of course, body composition. And in studies, they look at it as fat-free mass, but we can think about it as body fat percentage. Um, and the reason that that's important is because there are a whole host of metabolic benefits when you when your body fat is is lower. But body composition also means um, not just body fat percentage, but how much muscle mass do you have? And those two things are going to be very important because as we've learned in previous classes, your body fat is not just sitting there. It's metabolically active and it's releasing inflammatory chemicals. We spoke about it a few weeks ago, how the visceral fat that surrounds your organs is three times more inflammatory than the fat um, in the rest of your body. So when you have this fat, uh, any kind of, I mean, we, we need a little bit of fat, of course, uh, too low of fat is, is unhealthy, uh, at, you know, is also very unhealthy. Our bodies are meant to have a store of fat, uh, but having too much, especially visceral fat. And as the fat increases, there's metabolic damage that happens. You, you'll have increases in risk for cardiovascular disease and insulin resistance and a whole host of things. So it is important that, that we have an idea of what our body composition is. And one of the things I that actually Jack Elaine used to, used to say over and over again, and we'll talk a little bit about Jack Elaine because he's one of my favorite you know, personalities in, in history, quite frankly. And he used to say that, you know, a lot of people, they may have been, um, they may in their, in their college years, they may have been, let's say 160 pounds and, you know, 
then in their in their 50s, they still might be 100, 160 pounds. Uh, the point is, is that your body composition is, even if your weight is the same, it doesn't matter. Be, the reason it doesn't matter is because when you were younger, you know, you lose, I don't know, it's like three to 5% uh, body uh, muscle mass per, per decade after, you know, after your 20s. So the point is, is that you really need to be measuring your body in, in and again, he was so ahead of his time. He was telling people that you should be measuring your waist. You should be measuring your hips and they should basically be the way they were when you were younger. And that's how to assess body composition for, for Jack Elaine. And there, there's benefit to that. And of course, now we have more technology that allows us to be able to do those things. And we'll talk about them uh, as we go on. But he basically said, you know, just because you're the same weight, you know, fat and muscle, they weigh different things. They weigh different amounts, of course. And, you know, if you, you know, muscle tends to weigh more than fat. Um, and, you know, depending on how much muscle you've lost and fat you've gained, your weight can stay exactly the same while you're just getting more unhealthy and by, by the day. So um, again, he was completely ahead of his time. He spoke about that quite a bit. Uh, one way is bulk strength, one, one rep max, uh, heart rate. In other words, one way of measuring your fitness in terms of heart rate is to do the same exercise over you know, three or four weeks and to measure your heart rate at the end of the exercise. And your body should be adapting. If it's not adapting and it's not getting better, then you need to either change things up, increase intensity, or whatever the case may be. The point is, is that, of course, uh, sometimes when I mention that to, to people, they say, well, you know, I can't continually um, increase. I mean, if I'm doing the same exercise, well, the point is, is that you're never going to continue doing the same exercise. And the reason is, is because your body has been designed to adapt. And, and again, going back to Jack Elaine, I forget exactly how often he would change. I think it was every three weeks, he would completely change up his routines, whether that was, you know, how he was doing his weights, he might've been you know, doing uh, 12 reps, uh, and then he, he'd go to 20 reps for three weeks, and then he'd go to six reps, slow, slow, deep re uh, reps with his weights, um, and he would change up his, his cardiovascular training. So the point is, is that, he, of course, he would be able to know that he's adapting, and you need to be aware of that. If you're, if you're just lifting the exact same amount every day, and you're walking the exact same amount every day, you're not challenging your challenging your body the way your body needs to be challenged. And that is by, uh, by switching things up. And the heart rate is one way to measure that, at least from, from a cardiovascular perspective. Uh, if your, if your goal is to run, um, you know, if your goal is to run two miles every morning, fine, set that as a goal. And then at the, and then measure your heart rate and see that your heart rate is, you know, in the beginning, of course, your heart rate is going to be high, but as your body adapts, your heart rate should, should be able to adapt to that exercise. Um, okay, next is muscle endurance. Uh, another way that, that people sometimes measure fitness, sit-ups, push-ups, planks. Planks are, you know, when you lie like this down and you're, you know, you're flat and your stomach, your core and abdomen are, uh, you know, horizontal um, and seeing how long you can last that way. Uh, flexibility, of course, is an indicator of fitness. Uh, we, a lot of us lose our flexibility. I'm not as, as flexible as I, as I would like to be, and it needs to always be included in your, in your fitness in some way. And then there's balance. And of course, if you're doing all these other things, generally speaking, your balance is probably going to be great. But of course, things like Tai Chi and Qigong, yoga, Pilates, all these are very good for balance. And, you know, I've spoken about Tai Chi and Qigong at length because I, I've done that for years and it, it does help with balance, of course, but it also helps with endurance. It helps with flexibility, depending on the, on the, the form of Tai Chi or Qigong, it can definitely help with, with, uh, with cardiovascular, uh, not, not so much with bulk strength. Uh, there's definitely some studies to show improved body composition and I don't know if they've ever done VO2 max, but there's no question that it is an overall fitness as is yoga and has additional benefits that would require, you know, obviously an entire, entire lecture. 
So let's move on to, we spoke a lot actually already about these types of exercises. And my goal for tonight, again, is not, not to give you an exercise regimen at all. It is to give you a better understanding of looking at fitness from, from the perspective, from a, a perspective that goes beyond, you know, weights and cardio. Um, a lot of us are sort of trapped in the eighties where people were doing aerobics and uh, women were doing aerobics and the men were doing uh, weights and there's a whole lot more to it. And I, and I hope you're actually, of course, many of you already uh, know that clearly, but until you sort of uh, see it and diagram it out, that's why I like, I like mind maps. Um, it just gives you a general idea that, okay, yeah, you know what, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not addressing everything that I should be addressing with what I'm doing in terms of movement and fitness. So low intensity cardio, of course, we spoke about this idea of saying, well, high intensity is where, you know, you're having trouble carrying on a conversation, you're huffing and puffing. And just so we, just so we get this out of the way, uh, doing that for a long period of time is, is, is not good for you. They've done studies on marathon runners and most marathon runners all, believe it or not, actually have some scarring in their heart from, from the excess strenuous activity that they do. Um, and think about what a, what a marathon runner look, um, looks like. They don't look like they, you know, they're very thin, their arms are very thin. And then take a look at a sprinter. Now a sprinter is high intensity, but is short. They are muscular. They, you know, they just look fitter than, than, than a marathon runner. I mean, if you think of, uh, you know, Usain Bolt, you know, the Jamaican fit. I mean, this guy was cut muscular and, uh, but, and even, and, you know, years ago, they weren't doing as many weights as, as they do now to build those muscles. But if, even if you look at Jesse Owens back in the, in the forties, when he was um, winning gold medals, he was still not, not like the sprinters today, but still a musc muscular fit looking guy. Whereas the marathon runners who do high intensity, long-term cardio really just generally don't look that healthy. So high intensity interval, you don't, these, these intervals that we spoke about, like the tip like Tabata, um, these are no more than 20 minutes. You know, obviously his was only four minutes, but if you look online and talk to people who are, you know, fitness certified fitness trainers and such, generally speaking, they're, they're going to be doing, you know, things like a minute on, a minute on, a minute off, that sort of thing, but no, for no more than 15 to 20 minutes. And that's all you need for, you know, for doing that just a couple of times a week. Now, low intensity cardio is, it would be something like walking, of course, where you know you can carry on a conversation, and there's so many benefits to walking. Uh, we're just going to go through a few of them. First of all, it we in the eight, one of the aging lectures we spoke about interleukin six. This is this chemical that is an inflammatory cytokine, and it it's associated with inflammation. We spoke about it also in the inflammation lecture, and walking reduces that. Also lowers your cholesterol, and they've actually done some studies to show well how much walking. And remarkably, they were able to do that because of people's iPhones. Uh, because if you go on your iPhone and look, you can see how many, you know, if you turned on, I don't even know if you need to have turned on the, the health section. If you go to your um, iPhone um, and you have your iPhone with you right now, and if you go search for health and go to the, no, it's called... Um, there's a health section and you can see, it may already be on. You can see how many steps you've taken. And I'm, I did 40, 5,400 steps per day, um, which is, which I'm trying to do a lot more. And, and the studies actually show that less than five to 7,000 per day, there's a surge of metabolic disease. So they looked, there's, there's a, they looked and they, they were actually able to find that people who were doing five to less than five to seven per day had more diabetes, more obesity, et cetera. And above 
that sort of five to 7,000 range, there, there was a dramatic decrease in all kinds of things from, from a metabolic disease to, to obesity and a whole host of things. Now, 10,000 steps per day, of course, that's been, a, that that's been a very trendy sort of goal for a lot of people to make, which I think is probably around five miles. And you know, essentially what this is saying is that we were meant to walk you know, a good three to five miles per day. And that if we are not doing that amount of walking, then, then we're, do, we're not doing something that we actually need to do for optimal health. I think that's what it actually says. I think we were programmed and evolved in such a way that that if we don't walk those three to five miles per day, that there's going to be uh, some problems. And we know that because just sitting around and not getting activity increases your inflammation. I mean, you would think that you're lying down and not moving wouldn't be associated with some sort of increase in like fire in the body, inflammation in the body, but yet there it is. And it's something that you should be conscious of. So above this amount, uh, drop in disease rate. So uh, there was a, there's a guy who um, wrote a book called In Praise of Walking. I didn't read the book, but I heard an interview with him. Uh, it's a whole book on just the benefits of walking. And essentially he, he, uh, he, he wrote an entire book on the benefits of walking and how important it is. And quite frankly, how we were meant to walk. And if we're not walking again, we're, we're missing out on something. Uh, increases alpha brain state, especially if you're walking in the forest, alpha brain state is associated with calmness and relaxation. Increased creativity, some really fascinating studies where they had people, uh, students walk around um, and then assess sort of the beauty of things and uh, or and the idea to generate ideas. And in both cases, they had increased creativity for problem solving, as well as sort of a, a improved mood and optimism as well. Uh, what's remarkable is the fact that it uh, interacts with your brain in ways you would never imagine. So your brain, you know, obviously when you're exercising, your brain is getting more blood flow. It's also getting more nutrients because of the, the increased blood flow. But there's also something called myokines, which are like cytokines, they're chemical messengers. Uh, but in this case, they can communicate, they're released by muscles when you do exercise and when you walk. And, <coughs> excuse me, and they can go all the way to the brain and induce positive changes. Additionally, when you're physically active and moving, your brain actually increases neural connections. So you can think of your brain as the more connections you have, the, the more, the, the deeper your, the, your brain is, the more effective it is at thinking. Um, and if you can think about it in the case of, you know, a computer, a computer who just has a few connections between things is not as strong and not as powerful as a, a massive supercomputer that has millions of connections between between different things. So these myo my myokines released by, by the muscles, they go all the way up into the brain and are capable of, of improving uh, brain function. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that the, the man who wrote that book uh, in Praise of Walking spoke about uh, is that, as I mentioned, is that there is this, this notion that we probably are meant to walk and one of the re one of the ways he he explains that is he says that you know ad adaptation to walking is very fast. In other words, for people who are walking, say the Appalachian Trail, the, you know in the first week they they can have trouble you know walk, going as far as they want. But literally the next week they're able to walk pretty much the entire day. So our bodies are remarkably adaptable to walking, and the same can't be said of running. You know, it takes time to adapt to, you know, going from a 5K to a 10K. You know, it's not going to happen in a week. It's going to happen with a very methodical training program. Uh, but walking, you know, if you're doing, first of all, everyone should start measuring the amount of steps they take. And you should increase by, by 5,000 wherever you're at. And adaptation to, is so great that you're going to be able to do it, generally speaking, if you're in generally good health. 
and it's certainly not going to be a risk. So do your best, uh, turn on your iPhone um, health section to see, to see right now. Um, if any of you have that and you haven't checked that part of, the, of your phone, it would be neat if you just post, post it for us. Okay, it's also, it can be social. You can walk with your, your loved ones and you can talk. Uh, there's something uh, uh, great about that. We spoke about it improving mood and, and depression. And this, these are dramatic improvements. Uh, the studies are, are absolutely dramatic. Some, the decreased risk of major depression in people who are doing a lot of walking is, is incredibly dramatic. And also reduced dementia. And doesn't it make sense when we think about it? We spoke about the things that it does for the brain, increased blood flow, increased nutrient delivery, these myokines and increased um, connections, neural connections, especially, you know, um, other types of things can, can increase those connections even further. If you learn, if you're doing sports or you're doing dancing, these are, are because you're learning various different types of movements, even more kinds of things that are challenging for your brain. We tend not to think of our brain as something that improves you know, we think about thinking and learning as something that improves our, our brain capability, but movement, a lar large part of our brain is, is associated with movement. And if you're not doing challenging movement, new types of movement, these sorts of things, then you're not, you know, you're not increasing the complexity of your brain, which is obviously something that we want to do as we get older. Okay, so we spoke about a high intensity cardio and Again, you know, the days of running on the treadmill out of breath for 30 to 40 minutes are over. There is absolutely no, no need to do that. And overtraining has its own problems. Uh, believe it or not, overtraining can actually lower your immune system. It can actually cause um, problems with your gut, believe it or not, where the, the, you know, your gut becomes like what they call leaky gut. In other words, the the spaces between your gut and your blood actually sort of open up and allow things through that, that wouldn't get through. Um, so high intensity cardio can be a problem. So generally speaking, again, you don't need more than twice a week at maybe 20 minutes of intervals of some sort to, to be able to get there. Um, when we think of, of resistance training, we generally think of weights, but let's not forget about medicine balls, resistance bands, which I have scattered around me at all times, body weight exercises. There are so many incredible um, body weight exercises. I have a book of like, you know, a hundred body weight exercises. Um, you know, it's not just push-ups and sit-ups. There's so many different exercises that you can do. Uh, if you have a yoga mat, it's it's great. Uh, and what's what are the amazing things about about resistance, well, it better bones. Believe it or not, because you're you're doing well. First of all, when you build your muscles, your muscles are attached to your bones, so you need to have stronger bones. Uh, additionally, it's weight bearing, which is also going to to help with your bones. Helps with fat loss because when you have more muscle, your muscle is more active. It needs it. It's consuming more calories than the same amount of fat. And so if you have a lot of muscle and it needs, it needs energy, it's going to monopolize that energy. And then you will probably go into uh, a deficit and then your fat will be liberated and you will lose fat. Lowers blood sugar, um, partially because again, you're using the blood sugar, um, obviously. Uh, better sleep, better balance, all these things are amazing things. And there is no fitness without resistance training. You cannot just be fit from walking. You cannot just be fit from uh, resistance training. You, um, you can't just be fit by, by running. Uh, then you're, if you're missing out on developing muscles in your body, then it's going to be a problem. We've spoken many times about how as you get older, your fat actually starts to become filled with fat, almost like a steak is marbled. Well, the same thing happens naturally in your in your body as you get older. As a result, your metabolic rate obviously is going to go down, right? Because we just spoke about how muscle is consuming more energy. Um, if it's marbled with fat, then the, the rate is actually going to go down. And you could technically look exactly the same 
and consume the exact same number of calories, but because you have less total muscle, that amount of calories that kept you at the same weight as you get older is going to increase. So again, there is absolutely no real health and fitness without doing some sort of resistance training. Uh, and I can't stress that enough. Uh, next generation uh, is, um, by a Dr. Sato in probably the seventies. Um, and what it is, is it's a way of doing exercise that um, is where they actually restrict the blood flow to your limb. So they would put something around your arm and it would restrict the blood flow and create a situation where it looks like you're doing more exercise than you did. It's, it's preventing, um, it's you know increased lactic acid, it's preventing blood from returning. So it's causing a little bit more inflammation. And it was invented by, the, by this doctor. And this is him. He's in his mid seventies here. Uh, and you're able to maintain really, I mean, look at those biceps, holy cow, right? I mean, this guy, again, he's in his mid, mid seventies and he has those biceps. And you can see he has, he has the, these bands wrapped around his arms. And it's amazing, but it's been used in elderly people. Um, it's been used in, in people who are training. It's been used for um, people who are recovering from injuries. Uh, and it's really, I think, a major advance. Now you can't just, you know, you can't just put a tourniquet around your arm. That can cause nerve damage. It can cause, uh, you know, uh, terrible problems because of, of damaging uh, blood, you know, restricting blood flow. This is done in a very precise way. It has different, it's measuring the amount of arterial blood flow going in. It's measuring the amount of venous blood flow going in. So it's a very specific type of thing. So you certainly shouldn't try this on your own. Um, you should, the, the machines are quite, quite expensive, but what you're going to see is this is starting to be taken up in the United States. Uh, it's a very old Japanese, um, you know, technology invented by this guy. And he certainly looks like the picture of health. And there's several videos online that I, w I tried to put into the into here, but unfortunately I couldn't do that, where they showed a woman who was essentially uh, bedridden and virtually non, you know, nonverbal. And they started to do blood flow restriction because you're, in addition to, the, remember we spoke about these myokines that gets released and have the benefits throughout the body. So even though someone is relatively immobile, you can start to improve their musculature uh, functionally even. And as that happens, as we've spoken about up to this point, as your muscle mass starts to increase and become more efficient, that's going to affect a whole host of things in, in the body. And we spoke about how it can affect the brain in remarkable ways. And in this, this case, this woman who was in her 90s and she was became able to speak again and walk again uh, through, through this whole thing. So incredible brain effects, incredible muscle uh, and functional movement effects. And uh, right now we're seeing it mostly in, in uh, some, physical, some physical therapy places have this, some top athletes are using it and some sort of anti-aging um, doctors are, are using it as well into, into their 60s and 70s to, to maintain uh, muscle mass. Because again, this is not, muscle mass is a serious thing. Uh, you know, maybe you don't need to have biceps like Dr. Sato here in, when you're in, their, in your mid 70s, but we've spoken already about how important it is to maintain and to work on muscle mass because it is really the key. One of the, one of the keys, and hopefully you're seeing that there are multiple keys during this lecture, but one of the keys to maintaining healthy metabolism and better balance and, de you know, risk, risk, decrease risk for falls, increased bones, you know, better balance, better sleep, better blood sugar, all of these things associated with, with muscles. I think it's an amazing thing.
Okay, moving right along, just doing a time check. Wow, time flies. Flexibility, we spoke about. Um, again, yoga, tai chi, qigong are good for functional. Uh, I think qigong and, and tai chi are good for functional flexibility. Uh, there are flexibility assessments that you can find online where you know you measure how far you can bend over and compare that to the rest of the population. Uh, it, it's something to be conscious of along with everything else. So you do need to be conscious of all these things. And don't forget dancing. Dancing is probably one of the best exercises out there. And it's a, you know, it's a celebration of life and it's a connection with the people that you love. There are just so many benefits to dancing that it, it's really hard. You could probably do an entire class on the physiological, emotional, brain, everything, muscular benefits of, of, da of dancing. Another way to think about things is uh, we spoke about already aerobic versus uh, non uh, anaerobic, and obviously anything could be you know if you if you lift low amounts of weights you know really fast you're going to get a bit of a, an aerobic workout. So there's some sort of overlap in in these sorts of things, but um, it's just sort of another way that some people categorize it. But generally speaking, there is a, a, a guy who his name is, who's escaping me, um, who basically said, you can think about fitness this way, uh, lift heavy things, walk long distances, and sprint. And that really is a good way of thinking about it, because we're meant to lift, we're meant to challenge our muscles. Uh, we evolved to occasionally sprint or do something at high, short, short bursts of high intensity. And we were meant to do a lot of walking. So that, you know, that walk, sprint, and lift heavy things. I sort of think that that's really a great summary. Just going back in history, uh, there was a doctor by the name of Moses, Maim uh, Moses Maimonides, and he lived in the late 12th century. He was a famous doctor uh, who was the, he, he's also, he was a famous doctor to the Sultan of Egypt. Uh, he, he grew up in Spain. Uh, he was a, also a rabbi, a great rabbi, probably one of the best, one of the, one of the, arguably one of the most brilliant uh, in all of history, believe it or not. Uh, but he was, and he wrote numerous, numerous books, and he was also a physician. Um, and he, he was a very well noted physician. Um, and in addition to being the physician to the, the Sultan of Egypt, where he eventually settled, he also had a practice where, you know, in one of his, I should have gotten that quote where he talks about how we would spend the day at, at the castle or wherever the king, wherever the Sultan lived. And then he would have a whole host of people, patients waiting for him when, when he got home. Uh, and remarkably, he, he wrote, I mean, many, many volumes and volumes of books. I don't know how he did it, but even he back in the, um, in the 12th century wrote some things about exercise. And he wrote, wrote, and you know, again, this is one of the wisest men in history. Everyone who sits back secure in his self-confidence and does not exercise, even, even if he eats healthy foods, and even if he takes good medical care of himself, all of his days will be painful ones and he will be weakened. And this is one of my favorites. Uh, For there are many things that are necessary or very useful according to some people, whereas according to others, they are not at all needed as is the case with regards to the different kinds of bodily exercise, which are necessary for the preservation of health according to the prescription of those who know the art of medicine. Those who accomplish acts of exercising their body in the wish to be healthy, engaging in ball games, wrestling, boxing, and the suspension of breathing are in the opinion of the ignorant engaged in frivolous actions, whereas they are not frivolous according to the sages. So one of the reasons I like this quote is one, because he mentions multiple ty types of exercises. You know, he talks about ball games, wrestling, and curiously, this sort of suspension of breathing, which could be anything from, you know, uh, perhaps a type of, a type of yoga of, uh, of the time or some sort of breathing, breathing exercises, breath holding exercises, whatever the, the case, you know, I don't think anyone knows exactly what type of exercise he was directly referring to. That's the first thing I like about this quote. The second thing I'd like to point out here is that even in the 12th, look, we all know nowadays that people who are like really into fitness are often looked at as strange, you know, not as much as, 
as you know, 30, 40 years ago, but still people who are into the, into, you know, maintaining their body and such are still looked at a little bit in a strange fashion. And even back in the 12th century, you know, he's mentioning people who are ignorant of this knowledge as well. Um, and anyway, I, I just happen to like this quote and it's from one of the greatest physicians and greatest minds in history. Um, and his, his dietary advice would be worth looking at as well, just, just from a, partly from a historical perspective, but he was a very, very wise man when it comes to having a, an understanding of, of the human body and just, just being a wise guy all around. Okay, so next moving on to Jack LaLanne, uh, all of you are probably aware of Jack LaLanne. And this notion, I mean, people really looked at him like he was a complete lunatic when he started. And there's this funny YouTube video you can see, you can find on YouTube of him on the on Groucho Marx's show. And he was probably in his 20s at the time. And Groucho Marx just really completely made fun of him. Of course, Jack Elaine di didn't take it personally <laughs> at all. Uh, the point is, is that most of what Jack Elaine said is just partly common knowledge at this point and taken as you know, I mean, he, he really, he invented so many of the machines that are in the gym. Um, and, you know, even in the, I think it was in the, must have been in the late 50s, you know, he had that TV show uh, where he got women housewives up and out of their chairs. And I mean, think about how ahead of your time you have to be in America to to have really stepped forward and, and did that. He says, you know, people thought I was a charlatan and a nut. The doctors were against me. They said that working out with weights would give people heart attacks and they would lose their sex drive. I mean, it's true that doctors were concerned about building extra muscle at the time. And uh, so I, I put this and the quote from Imonides with the express thought or suggestion to you that even you, you, even you still might think that, you know, doing multiple types of exercise and all these, looking at it from the various perspectives is, is overkill, but it's, it, and I show you Jack Elaine only because he was so ahead of his time. And these sorts of things are going to become common knowledge. Most of what I'm discussing already is common knowledge. And it just requires you to make the experiment on yourself so you can see things. Uh, one of his favorite quotes, exercise is king and nutrition is queen. Together, you have a kingdom. Um, physical fitness takes commitment to exercise just as it requires good nutrition, but it doesn't have to be painful, just the opposite. Vigorous exercise actually is stimulating. It boosts your energy levels, invigorates your mind, and just feels good afterwards. The hardest part, of course, is getting started. And isn't that the truth? The hardest part is getting started, but you know, if you just do it and keep doing it, then it becomes a habit like brushing your teeth. <clears throat> uh, he had several quotes that were amazing. One of them was that once uh, one, someone asked him once, you know, he, he, would, he would basically work out for two hours a day. He would do one hour of weights and basically a one hour of some, some type of cardio, mostly swimming. And someone asked him once, how, how do you know when to stop swimming? And he said something like, you got to swim till you damn near die. That's what he said. Now, of course, you know, he, how many people have two hours a day? Well, they don't. And the point is, I hope you're getting to see is that with the latest things that we're learning, like that Dr. Tabata learned that you don't have to, you know, exercise at full strength for an hour uh, in the pool. You don't need to do that to get fitness. Um, that fitness and health and all these changes that we need to make are going to become more and more optimized. Um, and that's why we're gonna end tonight's class talking about technology and how you can use technology to, to help things. Um, people don't die of old age, they die of neglect. I like that one. Another one he, he used to say is something like, you know, they asked him, do you really like exercising? And he would say something like, I like how it makes me feel, but you know, I, no one likes getting out of a hot bed, or getting out of a warm bed with a hot woman and going to a cold gym. That was one of my other favorites that, uh, that, that I liked. Okay, so we're gonna end tonight's class 
talking a little bit about uh, what's called the quantified self. And this is sort of the, the name given to the movement of using technology to record and measure your yourself, various metrics that are involved. And I just wanted to go through these. Now, many of you know a lot about these. In fact, it's amazing when I'm seeing patients, what percentage of them have, have Fitbit. Uh, and there's others, there's one called an Aura, which is, uh, which is like a ring that measures different things. And then there's a Whoop, which is like a chest strap that's, that, that measures things as well. And if you have, at the very least, you know, turn on your iPhone and really see how many steps you're taking. If, that, if there were one thing that I could get everyone to do is to just increase the number of steps they do five, by 5,000 a day. And as I said, your body is going to rapidly adapt because you were meant to walk. Uh, body fat scales, obviously, there are very there are various ways of measuring body fat. There's calipers where you can like it allows you to pinch various parts of your body, and then um, there's a, you put, you record them and it 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 can give you uh, a rough body fat. There's what's called um, hydrostatic underwater measurement, which is a way of measuring body fat where they submerge you. And they can see basically the rate, the ratio of, of fat. They know the density of fat and they know the density of muscle. So they can come up with a, a uh, general body fat. That's probably the most effective way. And then there are body fat scales and the body fat scales work by, I think they, I'm not exactly sure how they work, but I think they send like a small electrical signal um, and they, and they, they can measure the impedance, like the resistance, and they can sort of tell from that what the what the body fat is. Um, they, they work pretty decently and you can use them to, to, to track things. You can buy them for like $20 on Amazon. Um, I think measuring tapes are still great. Uh, there's a measuring tape that I have that my one of my friends who is a very famous weight loss doctor in Brazil uses for his patients and uh, it pairs with your iPhone and it allows you to measure, you know, your waist, your hips, your biceps, your your neck, and it and um, it can allow you to track those things. Because remember, even as I said, Jacqueline years years back was talking about how you really need to to measure things to be able to make sure that you you just can't go by your weight alone. Um, and then there's uh, ketone and blood sugar monitoring, which is becoming more and more popular, believe it or not, with people who are not diabetic. Uh, speaking of the blood sugar monitoring. And the reason is, is because as I've spoken about on many occasions, anytime your blood sugar spikes, um, which happens naturally after you eat, of course, but you don't want it to spike too much and too high. Anytime that happens, there's damage to your body. And by, by doing blood sugar monitoring, either by finger stick or what's becoming more popular is, I forget the name of the machine, but uh, you just basically put it on the back of your arm you can find out that there are certain foods that you may eat that be that might be making your blood sugar rise more than you might think. And for people who are just trying to optimize things, they they've done they do that. I haven't done that myself, but it it's certainly something that's very interesting. And I've certainly spoken about ordering your own blood tests and that sort of thing. So obviously, um, this is another way of sort of measuring things and being more in control of your own health, becoming your own authority as I always say, becoming your own authority to, to be able to make decisions for yourself and to learn the things that are required to, to become healthier. Okay, so we covered everything that I wanted to cover and uh, I have a small, I have a little test of course. So let's go to my test. Uh, still getting good, good, good comments on that. And uh, I might add that in two weeks, I am going to be detailing um, a three month program that I'm going to be creating for people. And that's going to be a three month experience. It's going to be associated with a one week each month of a five day, what's called biological fasting kit. Uh, and then it's going to be paired with self quantifying yourself. So I'll be teaching you how doing things like body fat measurement. Uh, we'll be doing food journal analysis. A dietitian will and me will be going, <clears throat> going over that. We'll have office hours and lectures that will go deep into depth about uh, how to optimize your health, even in more detail than we're, we're doing now. Um, anyway, that's coming up in a couple of weeks. But anyway, let's get to um, 
let's get to the test here. One moment. Let's see. Okay, one second. And oh, here we go. Okay. Okay, so you should, do you see my, do you see the um, screen? If you do, let me know. It doesn't, it's not showing me that. I put it in the chat box if you can see the, the test on your screen. For some reason it looks like it's not. Okay, good, thanks, thanks everyone. All right, so let me blow it up a little bit. Oops. Okay, so VO2 is a great measure of fitness because it shows how good you can use O2. It is a rough measure of endurance. It measures how much blood you can pump, all of the above. Helen is always the first to answer the questions. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, D, all of the above. Next. What's the best way to measure body fat? Calipers, scales, hydrostatic, underwater weight. Of course, unfortunately, getting back to the VO2, you can't really measure VO2 on your own, but it's more of an educational uh, type, of, type of thing, just so you can understand fitness from a better perspective. That's correct, the underwater. And actually, of course, with COVID, I'm not sure I would do it, but um, beforehand, when I lived in LA, um, when I lived in Santa Monica, they, you know, in Venice, you know, near Venice, you know, near Gold's Gym and stuff, they actually had a mobile unit where people could, could go go in and get their body fat measured. And I've seen them in Miami Beach here as well, but um, so they're not available everywhere, but um, of course with COVID, I'm not sure I would be interested in even doing that. Which is both a good exercise for endurance and core strength, push up, sit up, plank, or all of the above. Not too creative, the, the, uh, the questions today, of course, but still gives a little review, which I like to do, which is better for building better bones, walking or weightlifting. Yeah, I mean, they're both good. What you should know is, of course, swimming is not going to be that great for building strong bones. It can certainly be a very good exercise. And of course, you're, you want to you want to switch things up. If, if there's anything that you get out of this, is one, you should be walking more. And two, you gotta, you gotta mix it up, try different things. You know, you gotta challenge your body in, in as, as much as you can. How much walking do you need to do per day? Studies show more than five to 7,000 steps per day. Studies show about 10,000 a day. Studies show about 3,500 a day. So, the answer actually is uh, around just a little more than five to 7,000. Uh, you want to, if you do 10,000, great. You should do 10,000. Uh, but the studies show that the risk for disease drops dramatically after that sort of five to 7,000. Um, and basically as, as the author of that book and expert on walking says, says in his interviews, you should just try to increase 5,000 and you'll probably get to, to where you need to be. How does exercise influence the brain? Increase blood flow, myokines, increase neural connections, improve, improve mood. Of course, it's all of the above. That's an easy one. And number seven is, uh, what is the most underrated exercise in the world? Okay, well, this is, this is totally, I'm totally partial to that, but I think, that I don't care if you're a man or a woman, um, dancing is, I think, the most underrated exercise in the world. And I just saw this, this video. Um, I just saw this video about the, the island of um, Ikaria in Greece, where they all where they have one of those places where they live to like, you know, one of the blue, one of the blue zones where they live, there are more 100 year old people there than, than anywhere else. And the amount of, you know, every week they would have in this town square, like hours of, of dancing. 
and drinking wine. And I think, you know, it's not, obviously there's so much to the social connectedness of people that leads to, to longevity. Um, but how amazing is it that dancing evolved in such a way in that culture? I'm sure there's no, there's no question that, that the dancing and the music and the social and the wine, of course, all that in that area um, is probably responsible for, for, for that. So I'd like, oh, so someone's asking, what's the name of the outline software you use? It's called MindX, uh, mind map software. Um, so thank you for your attention tonight. I, I did add one question here, but it didn't, didn't get put in here, but I would like to hear what is the one thing that you're going to do now, now that you heard this lecture, um, what's the one thing you're going to add to your your routine or your life? If type that into into the the box, okay, nice. Add five thousand steps. Yep. Walk more. Excellent. Okay, good. Push. -up. Someone's going to be doing more push-ups. Okay. Yep. Take the evening walk. Walk more. That that would be great. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you all for your attention. We came up to the end of the hour. Next week, we're going to be talking about, um, but Terry says she walks an hour because of your videos, because a walk in, I'll, do you walk while you're listening or you're going to walk now, Terry? Okay. So, um, yeah, you know, obviously as, as many of you know, you can get a treadmill. Um, I have a little stepper that I, cause this is a stand up desk. So sometimes I work and I step. Um, you can buy, I, I've thought about buying a treadmill, um, but I, I find that if I just force myself to go out um, or walk for a little while, it, it's better for me. It gets me out of the house and gets, gets fresh air. So, uh, but you could do both, of course. The more walking, the better. Uh, next, we're gonna be talking about diabetes and obesity and looking at it from a historical perspective because actually when you understand why modern society has it has constructed our, our modern society is constructed in such a way that that it almost is is hard, is hard to believe that not that everyone isn't diabetic and when you understand actually what happens along the way historically speaking that that's led to people having type 2 diabetes and obesity the it gives you the answers to actually reversing it so I think you're really going to enjoy that. And then the week after that, I'm going to talk more about sort of the fasting and, uh, and how to incorporate that in, into, into, your, into your life in a very easy way. So thank you everyone for your attention. Again, I always enjoy these and I uh, love the participation. And, um, and I wish all of you, uh, I hope everyone stays well and I'll see you next week. Good night.